Uh, I'm glad to be back. I've been out of town uh, with different Army stuff, and it always cracks me up because Brother Joseph, every time I miss church, I miss church. I'm out doing other ministry stuff. He always texts me and goes, hey, I noticed you weren't here. Where, where are you at? I'm like, brother, I'm skipping church. Please quit texting me. I, mean, I want to feel that conviction. I uh, thank God for Brother Joseph. But we'll be in uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter. We've been actually going through this book in the men's Bible study that we've been doing for foundations. And I figured it would be a good opportunity to take some of the, the principles that are taught here, some of the, the truth that's taught here, and give you some encouragement uh, from it specifically. Uh, we'll be picking up in verse 3 when you find your spot, 1 Peter chapter 1. All right, we'll pick up reading. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. We do thank you for your goodness, all that you've shown to us, Lord, for your mercy and grace. And what I do, thank you for this passage specifically, Lord, and help it to be an encouragement and a cause for rejoicing in our lives, Lord, for all that you have done and brought to us, Lord. I ask that you would help me to say what I need to say, nothing more, nothing less, and that everything would be done in a glorifying and honoring way to you, Lord. I pray for the congregation this evening, Lord, that you would soften their hearts to your word, Lord, that they would hold on to the truths of Scripture here, Lord, and have their lives changed, Lord, and be rejoicing uh, from the truth that is in here this evening, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray and ask all these things. Amen. I was wondering a way to grab y'all's attention, a attention getter is how we would start a sermon, something to grab your focus. And I can only really think of one thing, and it may not be too good, but I think it will serve the purpose of what I need it to do. We have all heard the phrase, at least the military folk in here have heard this, no soldier left behind. Who has heard that with a raise of hand? No soldier left behind. It is something pretty common, a common terminology used in the United States military. Uh, then, and it is, in my opinion, one thing that sets us apart as a fighting force. Uh, no soldier left behind is the idea that if a soldier is taken, lost, fallen in battle, etc., the United States military will never give up on recovering that soldier, going to get them, going to fight, uh, to be able to reach out there and, hey, we're going to take you home kind of thing. That idea uh, is what the no soldier left behind uh, communicates. And it's something we know pretty well. Uh, in the military, something that we would hold on to and hope that, yeah, if I get lost in battle or I get taken as a POW, someone's going to come look for me. And they're not just going to go, well, Evan's a lost cause, so uh, we'll just turn to the next thing. It is a sense of hope and encouragement that they actually take that so serious. And uh, we have seen this at times. The United States military has gone to extreme lengths, major uses of resources, and at times faced extreme danger to make that promise come through. This very idea was one that sat in the mind of many soldiers who were taken captive after being injured in battle. You name the war. But this is something that sat in their mind. The enemy, in many different POW situations, the enemy was absolutely terrible to these men, and they subjected them to the worst uh, things that POW could imagine. Right? Uh, you just picture in your head what goes on in those POW camps. Uh, they were being subjected to that. And where some soldiers, maybe of other countries perhaps, would have given up hope uh, these soldiers uh, that were the American troops had something to hold on to. They had that idea of no soldier left behind, and it was something they, were, uh, they hoped for. And it was this hope or assurance of that fact that gave them the mental strength and fortitude to push through the most difficult of suffering. You see, they wanted to live another day, and their hope was that the Army or the Marines or whatever could come get them or would come get them and bring that hope, that promise to pass. Or they had something to hold on to that helped them to go just the next day, the next day to suffer the next beating in the POW camp. They had something to hold on to. I know this promise is going to happen was the idea, and it helped them a great bit. Now, we as Christians, or more specifically us here at Odenton Baptist Church, may never be taken as POWs, but we will face trials and tribulations, and depending on what happens in the future, we may very well face persecutions in this country, depending on how much they want to reject God. We may face that in the future. 
And we see, it could be as to the likes of what we see the Christians face during Peter's writing, uh, during the time of Peter's writing of this epistle, where they suffered persecution widely. And with that I say, you need hope, all right? You need hope as it, it, is, what can, as it is what can bring us through tough times. If those trials and those persecutions were to come, or how about the trials that are going through your life right now, if they get even worse and worse, what are you going to hold on to? I tell you, you need hope. It's all something we need. And as we get into our passage tonight, we will see Peter write of a lively hope to a group of Christians suffering persecution. We will see very clearly that he tries to encourage the group with what is my title of this sermon, a lively hope. He's going to encourage them with a lively hope. But before that, let's get into some context. We also know that Peter the Apostle is writing this. He's writing specifically to some churches in Asia Minor, and those are the churches listed in verse 1. Uh, the epistle has a whole lot of context that would be understandable to a Jew- Jewish audience. All right? These were uh, largely uh, uh, who he's writing to, Jews that had gotten saved that were believers. And there's some uh, hints at that throughout this uh, letter. And Peter addresses specifically in verse 1, he says, the strangers scattered, all right? This is a common reference to those Jews outside the nation of Israel. Uh, now, these specifically would be Jewish believers within those churches of Asia Minor. They are scattered from the literal nation of Israel. They are out, out throughout the land. And, uh, and it, that idea follows, if he's writing specifically to them, it follows with the idea that, you know, Paul, not Paul, Peter is the apostle to the Jews, However, that does not mean to say that it is not applicable to you. Why? Because Peter does address the Gentiles in this letter also, because I don't know about you, but there is neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ's church, right? We are one and the same. We are believers in the same body. So there is application for you as well, and it's hinted at that Peter knew this. As we're told, the church is made up of Gentiles as well, as he hints at it in chapter 2, verse 10, when he says, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. There's application for, here, for you. And this letter largely deals with encouraging those believers of those churches in Asia Minor going through immense persecution and trials in the region. And he's trying to encourage them. Thus he begins his letter with encouragement, showing them of what, a, what specific people they are and what is the hope that they should hold on to in the midst of these persecutions, all right? Just like the soldiers in the POW camp, they had that hope that someone was, someone was going to come get them. Uh, these Christians had a hope they could also hold on to and is what he calls a lively hope. Now, we must ask this question, what is a lively hope? What is this, how is this supposed to bring me encouragement? So let's break this down. The first thing that we see is the hope. What is this hope that he's speaking about? When we hear people say, I hope so, it doesn't mean anything more than I really want this to happen or, you know, I, I hope this happens to me, right? This doesn't have a whole lot of weight. It's just this vain desire that it could come to pass, it could not come to pass, but that is not, as, that is not what is being spoken here. This hope is one of being fully convinced of a future truth, or could you, you could say assured of something coming to pass. The Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines it as such, confidence in a future event the highest degree of well-founded expectation of good as a hope founded on God's gracious promises. And let me tell you, if it's on God's gracious promises, it's pretty much set in stone. It's going to come to pass. All right? So it's not just this vain hope of, eh, I hope so. No, they were assured of this fact, and he's going to encourage them with this. Therefore, when we speak of this hope, is what we as Christians are assured will come to pass, and that, of course, is our salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are assured that we will be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, that uh, when the end of times happens, that we won't be tossed into a lake of fire. We will be in heaven with him. And we as Christians are confident that the future events uh, that will happen will be brought into heaven. Uh, Christ will return all this. We are not so much of, I hope this comes to pass, but we are assured of that fact because God's word testifies to it. And the other aspect of this lively hope is the word lively. Uh, we're told it's a lively hope, and it's an attribute. You basically could put the word there, living hope. It's a living hope, and two things could be said of this living hope. One, it is tied to the idea that, uh, that there is confidence in a future event of eternal life. Therefore, our, what we're assured of is a literal living state, a eternal life, if you will, is the idea. Uh, that's part of the reason it's called a living hope. The second 
can be tied into the idea of our waiting for this hope, right? We are in the state of living, uh, being assured that this is going to come to pass, and we are living in that state. So it's still a living hope. We are assured that it will come to pass. Therefore, our living hope, our lively hope, can be said to be our confidence of salvation unto eternal life that brings true, rejoiceful living. All right. Now, that's a whole lot of stuff. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you after I take a sip of water. <clears throat> Why would Peter encourage the church about this? Why would Peter use specifically this to encourage those believers going through persecution? They had something to hold on to. And Christians, I want to encourage you, and this is my proposition for you this evening, I want you to hold on to this lively hope. And specifically, I want you to do something with it. All right, we're not suffering persecution where we've got to worry about our life being taken today, but we sure do walk around uh, with our heads down acting like it at times. All right? So here's my proposition for you. This simple truth, it really is a simple biblical truth here. Rejoice in the lively hope that God has given you. A really simple truth. But too bad we walk around with our heads down. We should be rejoicing, and we're going to speak very clearly to that this evening. As I look around America today and I examine uh, true Christians living after the things of God, it seems that many walk a defeated life of sadness. Many Christians walk with their heads down as if the promise given to them by God will never come to pass. Even worse, even though we aren't in a POW camp, we have Christians whose attitude of sadness would convince you they are. This ought not to be so because you, are a, uh, you have a lively hope far better than any POW could ever have. Unless they were saved, of course. You have the assured promise from God that you have eternal life. You ought to be focusing on that. And as we are about to see Peter encourage these Christians in the letter who are suffering persecution, I want to encourage you believers by making clear to you your lively hope that you may greatly rejoice. So that's a specific what we're going to talk about this evening. I'm going to break down what this lively hope is and some of the truth that Peter breaks down to specifically encourage you that, hey, you might have some uh, rejoicing after the fact, all right? That it might cause you to rejoice instead of walking around with your head down and being upset with the small trials that we have here. Let's find some rejoicing in what Peter uses to encourage them. So let's look at what this lively hope is. The first thing I want to draw out is the assurance of our lively hope, the assurance of our lively hope. Let's pick up reading in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. First thing I want you to see is that it's according to God's mercy. God's mercy. Now, mercy is the benevolence mildness or tenderness of, a, of heart which disposes a person to overlook injuries or to treat a offender better than he deserves. I think that could be very clearly said of God's character and what he has done specifically for us. When we were sinners separated from God, what did we deserve? Wrath, hell, punishment, all these kind of things. Our sin had separated from us, and I think very clearly, if you don't think you're a bad enough person, then God, doesn't, God shouldn't judge you just a little bit. I think you might be a little bit misguided. God uh, has been extremely merciful to us, and that is one of the things clearly seen with his work on the cross. In Romans 5a says, But God committeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's mercy right there. That shows the mercy of God, and that is one thing that should give us assurance of this lively hope. All right, Think about it. We can have assurance of our lively hope because it is tied into God's mercy. All right, God is what we would say immutable. He is unchanging. He is just as merciful today as he was back then. Uh, there's plenty of parts in Psalms that says something like, his mercy endureth forever. And that if you read out all the verses, that's all you'd be saying for about 15 minutes. Be, his mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. That should give us assurance of this lively hope. If he has already extended salvation to us, if he has already offered salvation to us, uh, to a completely undeserving people, us, then why should we lose uh, assurance that this hope is going to come to pass because his mercy is not going to change? Let me rephrase that. God did not change. He's still as merciful as he was the day before, and we can rest the fact that he's not going to get upset and punish us now, all right? 
we have assurance that because God is merciful and has already offered us salvation, uh, we can be assured that what he said is going to come to pass will, in fact, come to pass. It is logical to assume that his mercy already bestowed should bring us assurance of our lively hope. So what is the application of this? Well, what can I take away from this mercy? See, when you are beat up over perhaps your sin, uh, all Christians have sin in their life, right? We think very heavily on that oftentimes, and we should, because it is terrible and it is awful, and we should not have that in our lives. But guess what? You're a sinner, just like me. But think about it. God's still merciful. God's mercy that he showed you on, uh, with his death on Calvary, and that day you believed on him, and it was applied to you, that mercy is still there. All right? He's not going to take that away. You can be assured uh, that there's assurance for your lively hope. The other thing we can see right here is that we are begotten unto it. All right? He says, begotten, begotten us again unto a lively hope. This is the idea, of course, of being born again. All right, you were spiritually dead, and when you got saved, you were regenerated or born again by the Holy Spirit. This quickening that makes you spiritually alive, this is the quickening that makes you spiritually alive and establishes uh, the eternal life aspect of salvation. Christ testifies to this in John chapter 3. He said, uh, we see Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And later on, verses 7 and 8, it says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and the hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell when it, come, when it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So this is that idea. You are born again unto a lively hope, a eternal life. And uh, therefore, you are born again to a lively hope. Let's take this to more of a practical aspect. Knowing of a certainty that our hope is that of eternal life, we know it is lively then. Uh, on a practical application, we should focus on being truly lively in our living hope. Does that make sense? Uh, let me break it down a little bit more clear than that. Christ told us, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And as we live today, we ought to be encouraged and full of joy as our hope is assured. If we've been born again into a living hope, essentially, we should not be walking around as dead corpses, upset uh, unassured that anything is going to come to pass. If we know this is fact, and we've been gotten into this, we should be rejoicing. We should be full of joy, being, you know, not sad and mopey, but rejoicing. Joyful Christians would be the idea. If you're born again into eternal life, that should drive you to live a rejoicing and active service to God, and that is what, because that is what you have been placed into. And might that similar idea be seen as Paul touched on in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And I always joke around, it's not a dead sacrifice, I'm not a corpse serving God, no. Do you think God wants you to serve him, even in the school ministry, in the soul winning ministries, with your head down, moping around as a dead corpse, a, a dead sacrifice to him? No. You're begotten again to a lively hope. It, it is one of rejoicing, full of joy. Right? And you say, well, that's easier said than done. It is. That's why I'm trying to encourage you by showing you this is the truth that your life is, that you have the hope of eternal life. It is assured for you. Okay? And the last thing we see in that verse is that Christ's resurrection assures it. Christ's resurrection is the foundation of our hope. Okay? Scripture paints this idea pretty clear. If Christ is not risen from the dead, we are utterly hopeless. Okay? The proof of his resurrection is the assurance to our eternal life. Second Timothy uh, one ten tells us this, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and mortality to light through the gospel. And then Paul speaks of this resurrection as the overarching point assuring our lively hope. He says, but if there be no, no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If Christ did not raise from the dead, Everything you believe is a lie, but he did, and uh, I was actually torn between preaching two different, uh, preaching something different, and it was the idea of being assured of something that had happened before you. In First John, uh, chapter First uh, John one verses one to four, uh, we have John basically laying out of the things he had seen and touched, and he basically repeats it over and over again. And what stands out to me is that John was sure of what he had saw. He was sure that he had seen the resurrected Savior. And we have those accounts all throughout Scripture. Uh, I know uh, Brother Broder teaches apologetics, and one of the things is the argument of the resurrection. The, 
I forgot how you say it, but basically you can't prove it wrong is the idea. All right, men lost their life. Something they could have been the first ones to know whether or not it was true, they willingly suffered persecution and died for it. They never turned up a body. Everything that lined up with the story of the gospel actually best fit the evidence that was shown. All right, you can be assured of the fact that these men who years and years later, decades later, are still writing that I know what happened, I saw the risen Savior, that should be an uh, encouragement, an assurance to you that Christ is truly risen from the dead. And if he be risen from the dead, that eternal life that he has promised you, you can be assured of that also. All right, that's the assurance of your lively hope. So what do you do? You rejoice in that. I know who I believed in. I know he's coming to save me. I'm actually going to have eternal life. I don't need to walk around as a sad, moping person. I can rejoice that when I die here, no matter how bad it gets, I'll have a home in heaven. All right? this is, I'm just a passing through, I think is how the song goes. We get too focused on here. I don't even watch the news anymore. I'm, it's kind of bad because people say, didn't you see this happen? Didn't you see that? I'm like, I haven't seen anything, actually. All right? Because I look at that, and this place is falling apart. All right? But Christ is still, he's still coming for me. My, my, the future's already, the story's already ended. I already know what the ending's going to be. All right, you don't have to tell me otherwise. I'm assured of the fact, and I rejoice because of that, because that lively hope that Christ has brought me. The second thing this evening is this, the inheritance of our lively hope. Let's read verse 4. To inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So being begotten into a lively hope, we are not only have the hope of eternal life, but we are also brought into a heavenly inheritance. So the question is, what is this inheritance? Well, clearly, I mean, there's a bunch of things that go with it, uh, crowns and uh, the glory of it all, but it is the inheritance of heaven, basically. It is the inheritance of, of its gifts that are a part of being heirs with Christ, as Paul tells us. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together with him. All those riches and glory that's in heaven, we are joint heirs in that inheritance, right? That is the inheritance of our lively hope that we are being brought into. Now, let's picture some, take some imagery. This might be a stretch, but bear with me. Take this imagery. In the beginning of the passage, Peter referred to the audience as strangers, did he not? And later on in the chapter, so we're not excluding the Gentiles, he also mentioned them, so basically he lumps in the Gentiles with the strangers. But understanding that idea of being a stranger, being alienated perhaps spiritually from God, the spiritual truth can be drawn uh, from the beginning of the letter is that, all, is that the Gentiles and all believers could all be said to have been spiritual strangers before Christ as they had no true relationship with the Father. Now, how does this apply to our inheritance, right? Now, strangers and people outside the camp of Israel obviously do not have an inheritance, okay? People who do not have a father do not have an inheritance, all right? That's not how this works. We could picture uh, that an orphan does not have the future inheritance to receive from his father as he does not know or have any relational ties to his father. Similarly, we, could, we before Christ did not have an eternal inheritance to look forward to. We were as strangers without a future hope or inheritance to look forward to. But now as Peter encourages the recipient of the letter and us, we are told that we are born again into an inheritance. We are now adopted into a family of God. This ensures that our heavenly inheritance is secured and is much better than anything we could have had previously hoped for in a material environment. All right? Basically, the idea is this. You were without an inheritance before Christ. But because Christ has saved you, now you are born again unto a family where you actually are going to have an inheritance, an eternal inheritance. And that I say amen, and that should encourage you, okay? And it's going to be much better. If you struggle here, guess what? It's going to be a thousand times better there. And if you do great here, it's going to be a, a million times better there, okay? There's nothing that can compare. So let's look at the description of this uh, inheritance. The first thing that we see is it's incorruptible. We're not going to spend too much time here because I'm running out. It's incorruptible. Basically, the idea is that it's, imper it's imperishable. It's not going to break down over time. Okay? Your riches will break down here. Uh, people that have that brand new 2024 Mercedes-Benz, guess what? As soon as that thing hits 100,000 miles, it's going to fall apart on you. It is corruptible for sure. All right? It may be a blessing now. It won't be later. It will be a headache. Anyway, moving along, we, have, we also see that it is undefiled. What does that mean? It's pure. 
It's not obtained by fraud or dishonesty, okay? Where people may seek after gains in this world and they have to be dishonest in how they get them, whether it be gambling or they are doing business moves to better themselves in the, uh, you know, the business environment, uh, ill-gotten gains, that kind of stuff. That's not how you receive your inheritance, right? It's, it's pure. It's everything that's given to you. There's no shadiness about it, uh, so to speak. And being undefiled, no one's going to be able to take it away from you. We also see that it fadeth not away. It is, uh, it is in one sense everlasting as it will not go away. They're hinted at in that. In another sense, it will never fade away from its beauty and brightness that so allures and brings us to all. Let me explain that. All right, that inheritance, that all that we're going to have when we get into heaven, um, you know, speaking back to the car, that brand new car, we may have that moment where we say, wow, this is great. The new car smell, we're in all of it. But I want you to know that your internal inheritance, being in heaven with Christ, all right, being in his glory, that all factor will never be lost. That never fades away. There will never be a moment in heaven where you are any less in awe than you were the instant you showed up there. You, you understand how crazy that is. We may live 70 years here, maybe 80 years, but we are going to live eternity there, and that will never fade away. That all of Jesus Christ, the all of all he has done will never fade away. We have something to look forward to, that great inheritance. And one thing I just wanted to point out as I was reading through this and breaking these things down was it really fits with the heavenly treasure described in Matthew chapter 6 as he writes, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for your treasure, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is there will your heart be also. I just added that in there because I'm sitting there reading it. It really sounds what Jesus told me to focus on in the first place, right? And the last thing we see is that it's reserved in heaven for you. It's already there, right? It's already waiting for you there. The last thing this evening, I'll be quick, is this. The safety of our lively hope. We have the assurance of our lively hope. We have the inheritance of our lively hope. And now we have the safety of our lively hope. Let's read in verse 5. It says, Who are kept... By the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. First thing you need to see, obviously, is that we are kept by God's power. Our eternal life or our heavenly inheritance is kept by God's power, not ours. All right? Might I mention that we are incredibly weak and hopeless, and there's nothing we can do. But guess what? That, that inheritance that we have to look forward to, God has, is holding on to, not us. That should show us that it's basically shut and secure. There is complete safety in that because it isn't really based on anything we have done. When speaking of God's love, we get a glimmer of what this keeping power could be described as. In Romans chapter 8, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a little glimmer of that protecting, keeping power. Okay, I may be able to keep something secure in my own hands for just a little bit of time. Let's go back to the car illustration. I, I get a brand new car. I'm trying to keep it very clean and nice, trying to make sure it doesn't get messed up or it doesn't corrupt on me. I'm changing the oil, that kind of stuff. And I go to the commissary. I go to the grocery store, and I park in the very back row just to make sure no one scratches it. And then I come out with my groceries, and there is... Uh, I don't know, a 2000 Toyota Corolla, and there's a giant dent in the side of my car. I can't keep you know, it protected at all times. Right? It's going to get beat up, and it's going to get dented. You know? It's the material world. But Christ, uh, your, your security in heaven, your internal inheritance, it isn't going to get messed up. It's not going to be destroyed. It's not going to be dented in a literal sense. All right? You can have that safety of it. The other f- fact is that we see that is faith that is unto salvation. All right, faith in Christ is what brings us to salvation, is it not? And we're going to tie this into how this uh, makes sense. All right, therefore, being justified, we, are, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, just speaking on the idea of being justified by faith. And, of course, we have Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right, it's about faith. All right, faith has brought us into this salvation. Now, why do I speak of this? Might this show us the safety of our lively hope because it was never by our works that we received this lively hope. It was 
Christ. Right? Now, if you're worried about, well, if I keep on messing up, my inheritance in heaven is going to be taken away. Um, no, because it was never of your works in the first place. If you repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? It ain't going to be taken away by your works. You're going to mess up. So you can have assurance that because the aspect of faith being what brings us into salvation, it isn't going to be by your works or your mess-ups or any other thing that will take away this inheritance, this lively hope from you. You can have the safety because of that faith that is unto salvation. All right, if our salvation was never works, how then are you going to lose it by your works? And lastly, we have ready to be revealed. It says this salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. This shows us two things. It is they're waiting for that day. It's already there. It's not, you know, I might catch them off guard if I die soon, too soon. No, God's prepared. He went and prepared a place for you. It is sitting there waiting for you. And guess what, as believers, as this is a assured of this fact that this is coming to pass, it's already appointed to you. It's already yours, essentially. In other words, we have security because it is set in stone because God has set it, stone, set it to be stone in his word. God said it, that settles it. Right? He promised you this. So that should bring you great security in this. Now I want you to picture the rejoicing of that day. It's ready to be revealed. Uh, all this ends, you're about to take your last breath, whatever. And all this ends, picture the rejoicing when all the sorrows of this life, all the trials of this life, all those things that brought you out of that rejoicing, brought you much sadness, like a POW. Picture that day when all that goes gone, no sin nature, you now have a glorified body, and you see Christ for the first time, all right? Picture that day, the amount of rejoicing that will be that day. As a matter of fact, we sing of it, I believe, did we not sing when we all get to heaven, I think this morning, that idea. If you would keep that, that picture in your head of that moment when you will see Christ, I think you might have some rejoicing that can drive you through some of the tough times now. See, why can't you have rejoicing, seeing as that that, that, that moment when you see Christ, when you uh, come into his, uh, his presence, that moment, that, that, that rejoicing that you're thinking of, why can't you have that now? Because it's already been promised to you, all right? And Christian, you have been appointed unto a lively hope, a, a, a lively hope, an inter, eternal inheritance, an eternal life that we are not in a, that in modern terms, we are not just hoping for, Okay? We can and should be absolutely assured of uh, this livelihood because God has declared it. So what does that mean for us believers? Why should I care about any of this? All right? This is why we should care. It should be the hallmark of Christian rejoicing. Peter states in chapter, or chapter 6, verse 6, in the very front, as he explains these, he's basically describing these Christians, he says, wherein you greatly rejoice. Now, I want you to know that these Christians were already suffering persecution. He's writing to encourage them, and he's saying, stating the fact that they are greatly rejoicing in this truth. And that should be what drives us from the spiritual truth, this, this truth of a life of hope. We should be rejoicing because of this. So, Christian, rejoice in this. Be assured of the eternal inheritance waiting to be revealed, and might, your focus, might you focus on that instead of the trials of this life. It's pretty uh, easy to get beat down when you're focusing on the troubles. But when you're thinking of Christ, um, everything kind of seems to wash away. It's such a simple truth. I think we would all agree, wow, this is a really simple thing. It is. But we all get beat up. We all, we all get sad. We all get upset. And if we would just stop and focus on that lively hope, that life with Christ that is awaiting us, uh, might we rejoice. So in closing, Bring this full circle, we must remember why Peter takes his time to mention this. The people he was writing to were suffering persecution and needed some encouragement. I don't know about you, but to know that all that could possibly go wrong in this life, the fact that I would still have Christ and with him I would have eternal life and an eternal inheritance brings me great encouragement and joy. So Christians, when suffering comes, Rejoice in the lively hope given to you from Christ. For Paul tells us this. Might this be the, the cherry on the top of this? It is, he truly believes this. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I agree, Paul. I don't even think it's worthy of comparing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you.
Lord, I do thank you for your word. I do thank you for all that you've done, Lord. Times may get tough here, Lord, but you have already given us a home in heaven, eternal life, Lord, and for that, I am extremely thankful, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would work on the hearts of the church here this evening, Lord, that you would help them to focus on you, Lord, and all that you've done for them, Lord, that, that you might be the encouragement, uh, the cause for rejoicing in their life, Lord. It really isn't that bad, seeing that you've already figured it all out, Lord. I do thank you for your word, and ask that you move in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.